production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences. This time on Broad and High. A beautiful display of art is hatched in Portsmouth. There's a total of 48 artists in the show, about 20 of whom come from central Ohio. Meet a Gehanna woman with a hidden talent. Being able to create things that other people will love, I think is what keeps me going. And Columbus band Maza Blaska. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Manicky. The 48 decorated ostrich eggs currently on view at the Southern Ohio Museum are the culmination of a years-long project by Columbus lawyer and art collector Charles Bluestone. Dozens of artists across Ohio were provided an egg to use as a canvas, and the creativity they each brought to the form is extraordinary. We stopped by the Portsmouth Museum to check it out. When I was a young attorney, I lived in Sutton Place on the east side of Manhattan. And every night I would take my dog, a Westie named Bucky, down East 58th Street for a walk. And on the way back, we'd pass a basement apartment that had a large picture window at street level. And at night, when the lights were on, we could see inside. And sitting on top of a big coffee table in front of the sofa was a, was a large um, bowl piled high with ostrich eggs. And I used to stop and look at the ostrich eggs and think about how incredibly beautiful and simple it was. And every once in a while, I would think about them. And I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if I took these, these eggs and had some of my artist friends make a painting on the egg, taking the same object and seeing how they, they can each transform it differently. So this is the egg that Charles gave me. It's a hollow ostrich egg. And um, it, holding it and feeling it in my hands, it has a really beautiful texture to it. And it also has a significant amount of weight to it consider, considering that it's an egg or an empty egg shell. It actually feels to me almost like ceramic. Uh, so I, I just intuitively want to put my ceramics on this. So I'm going to take this beautiful surface that's already here and attach some creatures onto it. I like the idea of, of the mystery of what's inside the egg, of what's contained within, knowing that there's a fetus of some sort in here, a, a baby waiting to be birthed in here. So I wanna put these fetuses, these intertwined creatures, all on the surface so that we get a peek at what's maybe on the inside of the egg. The title of the show is R360, Contemporary Art Hatching Across Ohio. And then serendipitously one day I met Charlotte Gordon from the Southern Ohio Museum. And I immediately thought this would segue so well into Clarence Carter. Clarence Holbrook Carter was uh, a painter who was born and raised here in Portsmouth. And Clarence Carter imagined our souls embodying this egg shape, this ovoid. And then being able to travel and transcend realms and travel around. And um, he, he was very articulate in his paintings in what he pictured happening to the human soul. Chuck had this passion for these ostrich eggs that echoed the spirit of Carter and his passion for, for this ovoid shape. They're just unbelievable displays of artistic imagination. A lot of them are pictures that unfold all the way around the piece. <laughs> Thank you. 
For me, ultimately, I was like, what am, how am I gonna approach this surface? It's so different for me. You know, obviously I've never done a watercolor on a three-dimensional surface. There's no chance that this re surface reacts the same way that like my paper does. And that's all I've painted on for the last five years is basically paper. And it absorbs a certain way and it dries a certain way. And so it's gonna be really interesting to see how the layering works on, you know, like a gessoed ostrich egg. Uh, so that was kind of the fun part, was thinking like, how am I gonna make my work translate onto an egg? What scene am I gonna do? Um, you know, typically I do a lot of like street scenes, urban scapes and, you know, cafe interiors and stuff like that. But how am I gonna like make that wrap? I like the concept of it being kind of wrapping all the way around. I didn't just want to make it like a curved scene and then just leave the back blank. I kind of wanted it to, I wanted to use the whole surface. I'm so used to drawing power lines and stuff on a straight surface. I'm really interested in how I'm gonna follow the contour of the egg. And it's just a really cool project to kind of take on. I'm really curious how other people did it too. I really want to know how everyone was painting these things. <laughs> I'm sure they had brilliant ways of doing it. And I've got mine stuck on a paintbrush. To me, what who, the audience for this show is going to be children. Here, every kid can relate to creating in their kitchen with mom and dad uh, homemade Easter eggs and those brilliant colors and the fun of that experience. And now with the, when the children come to see R360, they're not gonna appreciate that they're seeing fine artwork. They're gonna see wonderfully creative Easter eggs. And some of those children may one day be inspired to become artists themselves. And if that happens, I'll be very happy. Art 360 Degrees is on view through March 26 at the Southern Ohio Museum and Cultural Center in Portsmouth. Visit somacc.com to learn more. Cheryl Williams of Gehanna has a bit of a hidden talent. By day, she's a business analyst. But when her 9 to 5 day job is over, she comes home to literally sow the seeds of her creativity. Take a look. So I'm from Dayton, Ohio. I graduated from The Ohio State University in 2010 with my Bachelor's in Industrial Systems Engineering. Uh, so my mom's always been kind of the DIY person in the house. Um, I definitely get her DIY gene. Uh, me and my brother are both into like making clothes and making our own things. And how the business came about was I got a sewing machine for Christmas. My mom gave me the ringer of how to sew and load a bobbin and I broke about 10 needles before I actually got a smooth thing going and my brother actually knows how to sew so he gave me pointers and what fabrics to use and interfacing and cutting. So it was definitely self-taught, family taught, but no, so no formal training, but family training. So that's how Double Clutch came about is I wanted to be able to create things for other people to be able to carry all your necessities, but still be cute, still be fashionable. And like I said, you can never have one too many. <laughs> so I have FIFO wallets, which are just simple wallets you can use for credit cards, uh, business card holders. I also make tote bags, uh, clutches, because it is double clutched. Uh, so I make a variety of Clutches, I also make crossbody bags, and then I also make like wristlets and zip pouches for like makeup, and you can use it like as a purse organizer. One customer wanted a toiletry bag. I would have never thought to make one of those. I made one, I loved it. So now I'm gonna make toiletry bags. Um, I just got an order for a, a bifold wallet, so that's, that's due to go out the door, and then I also am experimenting with adding tabs on my zippers. Um, so they kind of gives it more professional clean look. So they call them fat quarters. It's a measurement of 18 inches by 22 inches, and if you take four of them, you get a yard. Um, so they're really easy, just small pieces of fabric that you can use to make like pot holders or bracelets or headbands or anything like that. So it was really just about getting in there, 
trying things out, not being afraid to mess up and find more fat quarters. <laughs> But on the inside of each piece, I kind of use something special. Well, not special, it's called interfacing. Um, and that kind of brings uh, extra quality and a stiffness and a sturdiness to the product. And so between the lining and your outside, there's actually something in the middle that keeps it kind of, gives it a little stiffness. I really like patterns that are bold but simple. So a lot of lines, a lot of geometric designs, triangles, squares, a lot of African prints have a lot of like bold lines and colors. Being able to create things that other people will love, I think is what keeps me going. So you sew everything kind of with the out, inside of the bag outside. Um, so you're kind of not being able to see what it's, the pocket is inside out, the lining's inside out, the exterior's inside out, but when it all comes together and you kind of flip it and it finally looks like a purse, that's probably the most exciting part. Like it looks like a square and I know there's a strap inside and there's some hardware in there, but then it finally it's like, oh, there's the purse that I just made. So the very end is probably the best part. See more of Cheryl's creations and read her blog posts at doubleclutched.com. And you can also follow her on Twitter and Instagram. In this next segment, you'll find that creativity definitely runs in the family. Delora Buford Buchanan of Dayton has been an art teacher for more than 30 years, and she does some amazing things with paper bags. And you'll see that Delora clearly has passed her love of art onto her daughter. Our friends at Think TV in Dayton bring us this story. My mother and father were people who exposed me to lots of different things and let, let me be me. So it was the same thing with the way art was. I could experiment, basically, and I like to do that. I think that growing up in a household like mine, you kind of had no choice but to be influenced by art. Definitely having a mother like mine has been a huge influence. She was always bringing things home, and she likes to share her process a lot. And so I think even before I made any kind of decision about what I wanted to be, I always knew how things could be done. And when I got older and started making my own work, I found myself just kind of jumping into the process without even questioning it. I became a paper bag artist because I was thinking about the fact that you don't have to have a lot of money to make things. And you can make all kinds of shapes with something as simple as a paper bag. And then I would started shaping and I started to make turtles. And I thought, oh my goodness, you really can. What else can I make with it? There's no waste when you can use things over. And then a lot of times I see things in things, like little beer caps and inside their bodies. A playing card is in there and then there's straws. So it's kind of like, a, it's in a way a recyclable type process too. Then I started to make people, little ones, miniatures. I kind of just like the way little dolls, little people look. And so I started to think how I could even maybe transform them and, and change them and elongate them and abstract them. I can make faces, but a lot of times you almost can see something, even if there isn't a face. I mean, it's almost like your imagination takes over. And, and then you don't need a face. I sculpted the sculpture of Jacoby when she was about 11, and it kind of looked like her, and we would be at shows, and she would be sitting there reading a book, and she'd move, and people would go like, oh my, <laughs> there's the real one, and the like. And um, I still like to do that. Now I can do 30 different things with a paper bag. I started dancing when I was nine or 10. I started in ballet. And so I think the first dance shoes I ever wore were actually my sister's old shoes. And so I took them and I think just having a love of music and really not having any choice but to kind of move around whenever I, I heard music had a lot to do with, with why I started dancing. So. 
I originally went to New York um, for dance. Wasn't really sure what kind of a dancer I wanted to be. Like I didn't think classical ballet would be the way for me to go, so I kind of aimed towards musical theater. And when I started choreographing, I could order costumes or have someone make them, but it just never occurred to me to do that. I just thought, well, I'll make the costumes myself. I managed to get injured, so when I found myself having to take time off and I started making costumes, one day I thought, actually, this could be it for me. I could be just as happy sewing and making things and watching people wear them. I think this could be what I do. I will go anywhere that requires making a costume <laughs> and that's actually how I got into doing the mermaid parades a friend of mine called me up I was living in New York and they called me and said oh there's this thing in Brooklyn it's like a parade or something do you want to go and I said oh sure and I got there and it was like like Coney Island's answer to Mardi Gras and so between that parade and then the Halloween parade in the village it gave me six months to conceive this really elaborate costume I got into steampunk in the way that a lot of people do, which is you come from like another subculture. Some people are into like gothic literature and art. For me, I was a big fan of like cyberpunk. So for anybody that doesn't know what steampunk is, it's basically Victorian science fiction. Visually, it's based in the Victorian age, and so it has that influence on it. But of course, you can bring futuristic elements into it, just as long as you're using materials that would have made sense to people of the time. And so there's a lot of brass, and there's a lot of copper and wood. And it just really lends itself to really great visuals. And I know a lot of people who don't just want to read the books. They want to read the books, and then they want to live in that world. And so I started thinking, how can I make things that help people live in that world that they love so much? My favorite thing, I think, is going to conventions and seeing people who are fully decked out, and then they turn their head, and there's like a hairpiece I made. <laughs> I love it, and I love to see what people do with my stuff, because I don't, I don't really make head-to-toe looks all the time, so I try to focus on small pieces that you can mix and match. And I think I've gotten a reputation for being that person that does like the weird stuff. I think, honestly, art is so much a part of my life that I almost don't know how to distinguish it from the other parts of my life, if that makes any sense. And so for me, I think it kind of goes back to how I grew up. I think art just is everything. It really is. If you're curious about the mermaid parade that Jacoby mentioned, it's happening in June this year on New York's Coney Island. And follow Jacoby on Instagram to keep up with her latest costume creations. You can find her at Jacoby Rose Makes Clothes. The members of Maza Blaska refer to their unique style of music as gypsy rock, with a sound that infuses elements of African and South American rhythms and melodies. Here's an introduction to the band and their recent single, White Curtain, which was shot at various locations around Columbus. My name is Yoni, and I sing and play guitar for Maza Blaska. I'm Ryan, and I play drums for Maza Blaska. I'm Sam, and I sing, play mandolin, Stratocaster, and glockenspiel for Maza Blaska. I really wanted to uh, start collaborating with someone, because I started writing songs, and Sam was in a different band at the time. started uh, like meeting once a week and playing together just messing around. And then Yoni was leaving to, for a study abroad program um, for 10 months and so I wanted to take that 10 months and really focus on making like a six song demo that I could bring back and you know form a band from. So right before he left we we wrote the first song that, that he would end up starting that demo from, and we wrote that while we were 
camping and we happened to be camping next to a group of people that were like doing a Native American like cultural heritage study or something. They were doing a lot of like singing and... Yeah, so basically um, since we were so interested in that Native American Indian type thing, we just looked up like names of people and... We found it in a baby name book, for, like Native, <laughs> Native American baby name yeah. book. And then it happened to be a name of a, a chief of the Sioux tribe. I think that the name kind of, since he was going to be writing songs while he was traveling, it kind of defined the... And integrating like <clears throat> that Native sound into like the music, we wanted to reflect that in the name. I think we mix a lot of sounds. Um, we've got some songs that like could be like folk like sounding and then some songs that like are definitely not uh, and might maybe more rock and roll. Like 60s influence like uh, pop with like a world beat.
That's our show. To see all of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. You can also find them on our free WOSU Public Media mobile app. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're wrapping up today's show with more sounds from Mazablaska. This track is off their 2011 album, Storyteller. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences.